Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here this evening. My name is Carmen Chan, and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Justice and Accountability. Uh, we're a United States-based organization dedicated to working with communities impacted by atrocity to seek truth, justice, and redress through strategic litigation and transitional justice strategies. We have been deeply engaged with Myanmar Civil Society working to document the prevention of crimes. Particularly, we were to start focused on crimes impacting women, uh, LGBTQ plus communities, um, and ethnic and religious minorities. It is our enormous privilege today to be co-hosting the session with Global Justice Center and the Asia Justice Coalition. And of course, enormous thanks go to the governments of Canada and the Shrine who are sponsoring this event. Um, just a quick note that this event is being taped um, for those of you who might be making interventions later. Um, and we are uh, uh, we will be posting um, the video of this event on the bond. So just to preview what the next 90 or so minutes are going to look like, um, we're going to open with remarks from the prosecutor, uh, followed um, with uh, uh, additional um, opening remarks from each of our panelists, um, and then after which we're going to have a moderated discussion. Uh, we might also have a brief intervention from um, the, uh, the ambassador from Canada um, when he shows up. Um, so when he does, uh, we'll be we'll, we'll listening for that. Um, so, uh, so uh, just to get us started then, um, I'd like to set the stage just a little bit. Um, as we all know, this year marks the five-year anniversary of the Rohingya crisis, and we are headed towards uh, the two-year anniversary of the military coup. We have witnessed six decades of impunity for uh, military violence against civilians in Myanmar's ethnic areas, um, virtually for as long as Myanmar has been an independent state. Accountability has been elusive for all of these crimes. And meanwhile, outrages continue against the civilian populations um, to this day. Destruction of villages in Chit State, violent repression of civilians protesting the coup across the country, including recent reports of students from the University um, having been sentenced to death for taking part in the protest. Yet there is some hope um, that there may finally see some legal reckoning for at least some of the top adults crimes. Uh, there are legal proceedings taking place at both the national and supranational levels. We've seen the establishment of the independent investigative mechanism for Myanmar. And tonight we are joined by a, a simply stellar group of speakers who are at the very front lines of accountability. They're here to discuss the opportunities for accountability as well as continuing challenges. Um, so my first uh, speaker today needs no introduction. Uh, he's the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Uh, Mr. Kumar, here to you. <laughs> it looks like my time is already out. So, um, Carmen, uh, thank you so much, uh, and really uh, for all of you that are here and giving your time in relation to an extremely uh, critical issue. Um, I was delighted, in fact, when I saw uh, this uh, event, I, I found a way uh, to make myself available and probably uh, took away the opportunities of somebody much better. That would otherwise have been speaking to you, but I really wanted to have the opportunity to speak. I think, as Carmen said, really the, the panelists that have uh, uh, been put together uh, by the Asian Justice Coalition and, uh, and Canada and uh, the Global uh, Justice Center, and all of you um, around the table, I see special advisors also linked to that, uh, Kim Salinger and, uh, and others uh, that uh, really are much more knowledgeable on so many issues than I am. The simple truth is that um, what the world has witnessed in Myanmar uh, is a scandal. We see terrible suffering against myriad sections of different communities, men, women, and children. Of course, in the midst of that, there's an armed struggle between the Tamadao and the Arakan army. And we have jurisdiction in relation to the investigation that was opened in uh, November 2019 in relation to only part of it, which is the cross-border uh, alleged criminality that we're looking at in relation to events in Myanmar that spilled over into Bangladesh and the State Party. And I'm really delighted to recognize also Ambassador Hamidullah, because Bangladesh has been uh, not only the trigger to the jurisdiction of the court, but um, has given refuge to millions of uh, Rohingya in very challenging circumstances. And it's been 
for a number of years, and I'm delighted that the cooperation you have in Bangladesh is meaningful. It's not just lip service, and what you, what you see is something different. And I want to have budget discussions uh, right now, but uh, I think that is to be applauded. Um, the time is ticking. 2019, 2021, 22. Um, what are we doing? Well, it can be not an excuse, but a legitimate issue that I have to raise COVID uh, into the fray. People, members of my team, I did go to Bangladesh to interview, even during that period. Some of them got COVID. And of course, prudence and uh, you know, um, duty of care, it did affect uh, the modalities of investigations. But I think collectively now we have to find a way to deliver for the victims that are suffering enormously. I raised this as one of my priorities. I went in uh, February to Bangladesh for the first time. I went to Cox's Bazaar, engaged with a myriad members of civil society, but also had very positive engagements with uh, Shimon Sima, the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, and other senior officials as well, that gave rise to something that uh, I think is important. We have a uh, premises uh, in Bangladesh, in Caucasus Bazaar, with the consent of the government from which we are able to conduct interviews. And that's an important step. At the same time, we are well aware of the issues of over documentation that have been uh, catalogued by PSBI and others, particularly in relation to sexual and gender based crimes, in a way that uh, is a dynamic that is unhealthy. We've seen it in Iraq, and we've seen it in Syria. And it's something that we try to uh, focus on, not only in, in, in my last mandate in the Trauma Informed Approach Field Guide, but even in the CSO guidelines that we produced um, along with Eurojust and the Genocide Network uh, only a short time ago to deal with this malady that tends to afflict these type of atrocity crimes that we are uh, looking at. Um, you know, of course, delighted to be next to my uh, dear friend and, and colleague, uh, Nick Kumja, because we're not the only show in town, and nor should we be. The scale of allegations have engaged both uh, the Gambia's uh, petition to the International Court of Justice, um, and also have engaged the Human Rights Council and the Geneva entities uh, to create the uh, inter independent international mechanism for Myanmar. And, very presciently in Resolution 4326, uh, my dear friend Nikunjan, as the first uh, special advisor, uh, the first uh, head of that entity, uh, is required to cooperate with the ICC along with us to support the International Court of Justice. Uh, and whilst we're not required to cooperate and reciprocate, we are doing so. And I think we've built up uh, increasingly effective lines of communication where we are not looking at our fiefdoms or uh, hiding behind independence to avoid uh, dialogue and cooperation, because in the end, it's not about Nick Kujan or Kareem Khan or the ICC or Myanmar. The I must be on the prize, which is to vindicate the rights of survivors. And I think this principle uh, is replicated more widely. One of the things that I want to advocate and I'd like to build is uh, well, a number of initiatives I've raised with the Secretary General of the United Nations that as the permanent international criminal court, we should, um, I've suggested respectfully that uh, at least once a year, we should sit down maybe with the head of UNICEF and the head of UN Women and uh, Primula Patton as the SRSG for sexual violence and conflict and Virginia Gambas as the uh, special representative secretary general for children and armed conflict and uh, Alice Dorito as the special advisor for prevention of genocide. Just to talk, and not encroach upon anybody's area, but how do we collectively, as the international community or institutions, coordinate so we get better results collectively? Because we have an obligation not to over-document. How does that work in practice? In my own view, but it's for others, because we, you know, we can't arrogate authority we don't have. I do think the more I see the landscape for which we have jurisdiction, that something similar, I don't want to scare people off here, but uh, something similar to OCHA. There's a need for OCHA, the Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance, in the space of humanitarian assistance. And I'm sure it's not beyond our wit to find a modality of 
doing something similar when it comes to accountability. Uh, I'm not saying that we need as the ICC to be the convener uh, and, and many options. It can be rotational, but what would you want is to bring various people to the table. So effectively, the funding that comes in, the entities that have been created, the architecture is not grinding the machine down, but actually works more smoothly than it's uh, perhaps uh, worked uh, in the past. And I think this is probably the need of the hour. We've tried to We'll see what happens. We've done something similar uh, in relation to Ukraine. Uh, it was at the ministerial in July. There was an agreement at ministerial level to establish a dialogue advisory group, which was really to work with civil society and state actors and uh, the UN. And I think something more broad and permanent may be helpful to make us uh, do better. Because at the end of the day, I, I keep saying it uh, in a different forum, we're not an APEX sport. The court of the ICC, in my view, you know, we're not a court of supervisory jurisdiction. Um, I like the analogy of being, a, of being a hub. So we're trying to build architecture in terms of the e-discovery and information technology, artificial intelligence, using the wonderful resources we've already started using since I established uh, the trust fund in March and when it came in to use, for example, uh, automated translation. And we can also use uh, voice to text transcription service, and then translation, and many other things as well. But this will allow us to also ingest more information, identify patterns, find reliable evidence. And then once you've filtered, uh, we'll call it sewage, but a variety of different types of evidence into what we think is pure, reliable information, either incriminating or valid excompatory evidence, we can use it before our judges, where we have jurisdiction, but also share it with other mechanisms, other courts, and other domestic jurisdictions. So collectively, we actually move forward and try to do better than the past, because for all the words of Never Again, and I mentioned in the PSVI, uh, Kim was there recently, you know, we should be ashamed. You know, Nadia Murad's book was the last girl, and she's not the last girl. There's conflict-related sexual violence taking place, as we speak, whether it's in, you know, the DRC or, uh, many other parts of the world. And so that joint ability of working together, not duplicating, but getting the dividends of domestic courts, uh, international courts, regional courts, and others is one that commits itself uh, to me. Linked to this is the imperative of being with the people. You know, we had a side event earlier with um, uh, Veronique Colbert that she chaired as head of the state of the children, and people were talking. Uh, in really wonderful terms, and Nick was one of the senior uh, most prosecutors with, with Brenda Hollis about the landmark decisions of the special court for Sierra Leone. And there's many reasons, and it's, 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 under, it's not heralded enough. It started and finished within a decade. It did really get its teeth into uh, the culture the culture of impunity and give justice. But I think one of the reasons why, in terms of, for example, Crimes against children, the landmark decisions, was because the people, Nick was living in Sierra Leone, the lawyers, the investigators in Sierra Leone, and they were working as you know, a foreign diaspora in a little key. They were working hand in glove with Sierra Leonean lawyers and investigators and witness support. And I think this is why I'm really quite adamant the modality of the office needs to change. We need to be with the people, and that way we will do better in terms of certain priority areas, which also include. A sexual agenda based violence and also crimes against infecting children. We're trying to do this. We've started now with a, a field presence uh, by a free facility, but we can't be bystanders. I do think engagement with ASEAN is key. Um, I'm trying to do that, and there are windows of opportunity. Next year, from January, Indonesia will become the chair of ASEAN. Indonesia, along with Malaysia, have taken a rather more principled, if I may say so, position. Uh, on this uh, issue of uh, the Rohingya. And I think we need to try to enhance those uh, ideas that we don't need to be a state party, to be a party to humanity and the international obligations that should motivate everybody when you have these moments in power, these moments of influence to bend the arc towards justice and accountability. And I think that's also an important part of the discourse to not simply talk to the bubbles but try to bring people in, whether they're on state parties or, or otherwise. So that's one of the issues. Because for all the efforts that we have at the ICC and elsewhere, and we see it in other situations, you have all the biggest 
high definition screens in the world for the people at Darfur or the people in you know, the Rohingya in, in camps, whatever cases they are found. But it's not quite the same when you are with the people and they see that you are, you know them, you've taken the time and the trouble to understand their experiences. The quality, the flavor of the cuisine of justice that is served becomes much more palatable and digestible because we're not an alien species in an alien looking court that simply doesn't accord with their living conditions and their own lived experiences. So I think this is a wonderful event. I won't keep rapping on, you very kind not to shut me down. So with that, I will just say thank you so much for the uh, for the invitation. And I think collectively, by sharing uh, knowledge, not duplicating the efforts, avoiding um, too much documentation, but trying to understand where the gaps are and not having these huge egos, um, you know, sometimes that exist, that we can probably do better for the victims. Thank you. Thank you, Prosecutor, for, uh, for laying the stage for us as well uh, to start our discussion this evening. So our first panelist of this evening is Mr. Tim Ken. Uh, Tim Ken is an ethnic Rohingya Muslim from the Arakan State, the Thai State, um, in Myanmar, and the president of the Burmese Rohingya Organization in the UK, um, and a prominent activist for the Rohingya people. He has spoken about the genocide facing the Rohingya before the US Congress, European Parliament, European Human Rights Council, the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, and other UN bodies. He has been one of the key civil society leaders advocating for accountability for the Rohingya genocide through universal jurisdiction and national courts. And so, um, so Tung Ken, I think uh, the prosecutor laid out quite well with ICC's work here um, it is its regard. Um, and so I think complementing the ICC's work it is a case proceeding under Argentina's universal jurisdiction laws. Um, your organization, Brooke, has been instrumental in the filing and prosecution of this case. And so can you tell us a little bit, please, about this case? Um, and share with us the current status, what you see as the next point says. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. thank you very much for organizing this important timely event where justice and accountability is very important for the Rohingya and all the people of Burma, as you all are aware of what is happening in Burma these days. And regarding on your question, you know, you are quite right when you refer to the relationship of complementarity between the case in Argentina and the ICC court. Criminal accountability for the most serious international crimes, including genocide, is articulated through the principle of complementarity, where international bodies such as ICC complement any national accountability initiative, like in this case in Argentina and under universal jurisdiction. I'm not a lawyer, but I am a wing activist. I understand very well the extraordinary challenges to seek justice for the genocide against our community. The idea that all efforts in this direction complement each other is very clear. After a number of discussions with my colleague Thomas Cantana, former UN Special Report on Burma from 2018 uh, 2008 to 2014, on the challenges in justice from in December 19, our organization, Burmese Rohingya Organization UK, took the bold decision to file criminal complaint in Argentina under the principle of universal jurisdiction for the genocide against Rohingya. During the attacks in 2012, 2016, and 2017. Although Argentina courts already processed few cases under UG, we knew that Myanmar case would bring controversy. To start with, Myanmar in Southeast Asia is on the other side of the planet from Argentina. Differences in language and culture are profound. Logistics to investigate are extremely problematic. Magnitude of the incidents. That led to genocide is overwhelming for a court to investigate. Many other questions were on the table, but we are determined to make it real, the simple idea that's behind the universal jurisdiction. A genocide, whatever it is, disturbed very essence of humanity, and humanity in whatever venue or location should proceed to the perpetrators and realize justice for victims. Actually, the international community, especially United Nations, has been 
repudiating the genocide and calling for accountability. We wanted the public commitment to be translated to, into reality. Argentina Code at first was reluctant to move forward, decided to miss uh, to dismiss our complaint. Three main argument. First claim is genocide was already being investigated at the end. Second, the Myanmar system could offer at some point in the future guarantees of independent and impartial justice, but that not having cultural connection between Myanmar and Argentina gives no reason to proceed. We filed an appeal and responded easily the last two arguments. There were no prospect that at some point, Myanmar was going to offer independent and impartial venue to investigate the genocide. And when the coup happened later on, that we just was clearer than ever. The court compared Myanmar to the Argentina case, where after the tape, the system allowed for persecution of the military officials who participated in the dictatorship during 1970s. But our simple point responding to this was that victims and justice in Myanmar cannot wait for decades. They deserve and have a right for contemporary accountability, especially since the condition for continuing genocide have not changed. The first argument dismissed the case was about proceedings at the prosecutor, at the office of the prosecutor of the ISIS. We had to explain at the Virginia court that the Hague was not addressing the right way, uh, not addressing right way the genocide and atrocities committed on the ground in hundreds of villages in Rakhine State. We approached by the office of the prosecutor, we explained the case. They were open to listen when the Argentina court issue rogatory left asking about their case. The office of, office of the prosecutor responded in very useful and constructive way, explaining that investigation was in the preliminaries and that prosecution and deportation were the main focus at the moment. We eagerly appreciated that official response from the Hague to Buenos Aires because it allowed us to repeat our argument that there was not overlapping at least at this stage. They even referred to importance of the principle of complementarity and said they support national initiatives for justice. With this convincing argument from outside, the appeal court had no other op option than overrule the dismissal of our complaint and in December 2021 ordered the first instant judge to launch the investigation. It was an historical victory for the Rohingya. It made a recognition of our right for justice, that chances for accountability, no matter the difficulties it's in. That human brotherhood, when addressing the horrors of genocide, is not just a declaration and principle. This decision reinforced our struggle, our strength, and our hope for a better future and fortified our sense of unity and community, unity or a sense of unity and community since the criminal investigation in Argentina had been pursued by Rohingya Dalisong without intermediation of any INGs. Let me share with you a situation explained that this sentiment, although it was a technical hearing where attorneys present legal arguments, we requested to appeal court to allow the victims to take the, to take the floor for some time. We explained how important it would be for Rohingya to directly address the court of law and the acceptance. The hearing was attended by our attorney, three judges, of the appeal court and by me, six Rohingya women living in the refugee camps, victims of 2017 so-called clearance operations. I was allowed to speak for five minutes and one of the women were, uh, on behalf of other spoke for five minutes. Even though the hearing was online, the atmosphere, atmosphere was extremely intense when I addressed the court and explained the situation of our community and especially when the women told our story of being tortured, raped, 
and their relatives brutally killed. And when she closed her statement saying to the judges, we want justice from Argentina court and in her Rohingya language. Which interpreters and translators first into English, then into Spanish with good professionals. And that instance was unique. But although all this was very important and also made justice, it was just the beginning. We are at court of law, UN reports, NGO reports, media outlets are important for the context, but they are not direct evidence. We had to design a plan to build the case under serious constraints of distance, language, culture. The very first step for the court was to take my testimony as a member of Rohingya community who speak about the genocide. I traveled to Buenos Aires and gave personal testimony. For the next step, we proposed the court uh, take direct testimony of six women who are part of the complaint, plus testimony of Rohingya administrator of the village where they used to live, Rathnidam district. And we decided to face the challenge of bringing the women all over from Bangladesh to Argentina so they can see the faith of justice. We see crucial empowerment of Rohingya women to give them voice so they can take hold of their fight of justice. It will be groundbreaking and unprecedented event an extraordinary story for the international media who is ready to cover the whole process. Hence, a strong message will be passed to the Myanmar military that the fight for justice, where it is about the most serious crimes like genocide, does not require respect, frontiers are barriers and continues and is moving forward. At the same time, it will be a strong signal from the international community to people living in Myanmar suffering humanized violations about the strength of international law and monetary literalism. For Argentina, it will be a unique and fundamental opportunity to be direct contact with victims of the Rohingya genocide, to hear tremendous testimonies and to ponder the magnitude of the genocide. Although they are aware about a long trip, the women are very excited about traveling to Buenos Aires in a journey for justice. In a very original experience, to make this happen, we are engaging not only with the Argentina and also Bangladesh government, but also with other supportive governments such as UK and US. We are expecting that in the very near future, the Rohingya group will be Argentina giving testimony to the poll. Their testimony will set the basis to establish the fact, at least in the village where they lived, and the next step with individualization of suspect. Once this happens, the court may issue arrest warrant, which can also have international impact through Interpol. We are going step by step. We don't want to go ahead of the proceedings. Since we filed a complaint, we have been engaging with the independent investigative mechanism from Myanmar, and they have been very supportive for our initiative. We push for IIWM to engage uh, with Argentinian judicial authorities in the April 2022. Nick Kumjoan uh, traveled to Argentina and personally met with the court and prosecutor. The prosecutor has asked IIWM upon BRO UK's request to formally share some evidence, including suspect list, documentary and contextual evidence. Some information on the parallel process has been exchanged so far, and we expect collaboration will continue and deepen. We also decided to focus on the role of Facebook in this spread of hate speech during the times of so-called clearance operation. Upon our request in September 2022, the court issued an official regulatory letter to the U.S. government under INCHA. American Convention on Mutual Assistance in Criminal Matters and Budapest Convention on Cybercrime requiring meta platforms to provide all the information collected regarding dissemin dissemination of the hated speech and incitement of incitement to violence towards the Rohingya community. We also require the court 
to ask the US Secretary of State, uh, Anthony Blinken, about his determination of genocide case against Rohingya. In September 2022, the court issued a regulatory letter asking the Department of the State to share a copy of its determination and all available information that can contribute to the Argentina investigation. In November 2022, last month, Ambassador Bat for Global Criminal Justice, U.S. State Department traveled to Argentina, met uh, Thomas Cantana to discuss this case. He also met our prosecu uh, the prosecutor in charge of the file. The ambassador expressed our government supports to the investigation and help channel of official requests. Many civil society organizations have been supporting our case in Argentina. It is worth to mention Global Justice Center that have prepared and submitted to the court a paper on best international and regional practices on the treatment of victims of sexual violence and cruelty gender, which will be helpful when the women travel to Argentina. As you see, we have been very active and the case in Argentina is moving forward. We hope in future more victims can give testimony before the court additional alternatives being considered, such as online interviews and possible trip of members of the court, prosecutor, members of the court of the prosecutor office to Bangladesh or any viable location. And I also want to thank your Bangladesh government. They are really supportive to bring genocide survivors, six women to Buenos Aires. This is very critical step for us to make it happen. And the people of Bangladesh, they have shown support and solidarity, hospitality, where our brothers and sisters, 1.2 million fled from their homeland, breathed their life, they fled to Bangladesh and Bangladesh. The people of Bangladesh and Bangladesh government have shown great humanity and support to the Rohingya people and also supporting of justice. I stop here. Thank you. Sorry, it's too long. No, that was wonderful. And thank you so much for that. First of all, laying out in such great detail uh, the proceedings in Argentina. I think that's incredibly helpful, even for those of us who um, may have followed this closely. Um, and then secondly, um, it was incredibly good to hear about um, how powerful um, um, it was for the community uh, to see um, a Rohingya organization um, in the lead in this work. And so uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Our, our next um, speaker is um, uh, Priya um, Uh She is an international lawyer with two decades of experience. She has worked in national and international institutions, including at the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and on um, humanitarian issues globally at the International Federation of the Red Cross and the Red Cross and Humanities headquarters in Geneva. She is a contributing editor to the International Law Blog of uh, the New Yorkers, and currently heads the Asia Justice and Publishing Secretariat, uh, which is focused on justice and accountability in Asia. Um, so, Priya, while the proceeding between the Gambia and Myanmar, the International Court of Justice, is an interstate dispute, at its core is the allegation that Myanmar's military and security forces perpetrated genocide of the Rohingya. Um, so, we'd be grateful for your insights on about that case, about where it's happening, where it's heading. Thank you, Carmen. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to co host this uh, event. You know, I, I strongly feel that global events are taking over. We've got a lot of uh, other areas to focus on, and I think it's critical to put Myanmar back on the map. And, you know, this is a, a ongoing escalating crisis and we really do need to refocus our attention back to what is happening in terms of impunity and you know continue our efforts towards accountability so i think i'll just uh, step back a little bit take you a little bit through the chronology of what is happening with one of the cases before one of the international courts as you know we've got the icc we've got the icj we've got the AAAF, we've got universal jurisdiction and we've got a lot of intersections between these but let me focus just a little bit on the ICJ to start with. Now, if you'll recall, November 2019, actually there was this one week in November where you had Brooke filing and instituting, you know, the case in Argentina. 
you had the institution of an application before the International Court of Justice, and you had the ICP decision on authorization to proceed all in that same week. So a lot of legal developments linked to this uh, situation. Now, the application at the International Court of Justice is by the Gambia versus Myanmar, and it is based on a violation of the Genocide Convention. Now, this raised a few questions, and you know, has, has, they have been addressed, but I think important to note that it's linked to that notion of Olga Omnis obligations and Olga Omnis parties obligations, which is that they are obligations that are incumbent on all of us as humanity, as signatories to the Genocide Convention, and that is not just about a specially affected state that you know can step up and take this legal battle to court. So here we have the Gambia, which actually stepped up and decided to file and institute this application and basically say, look, there are acts that are being undertaken in Myanmar against the Rohingya that would fall, which would fall foul of the Genocide uh, Convention, and this needs to be taken seriously and needs to be brought to the International Court of Justice. Now, I don't know if you'll recall, within a few weeks of that, um, the Gambia did also ask for interim orders of protection. So basically what are called provisional measures. And in December of 2019, it was a bit of a public spectacle. You had, you know, a, a court hearing, you had Aung San Suu Kyi as a state councillor appearing at the International Court of Justice on behalf of Myanmar. We saw pictures of these, um, you know, big screens put up in Yangon, where I, I think sort of never before the International Court of Justice hearings being publicized and, and in the public realm, really, um, as a bit of a flashpoint on what was happening and, and you know, uh, linked to the whole question of impunity of the black money. Subsequent to that, 23rd of January, the International Court of Justice quite fast came out with its provisional measures. And it was a unanimous decision. And I think, you know, it's important to highlight that, that even the judge ad hoc, who had been, who was on the bench on behalf of Myanmar, agreed with the decision. And certain measures were issued by the court. And the court has the bar to issue measures that are not necessarily asked of it. And the court did that in this case. The court basically said, ensure that evidence is um, conserved, ensure that you know, alleged genocidal acts are not carried out and that you need to stay in compliance with the Genocide Convention. And, and I think this is sort of quite crucial also now, is that one of the measures was that Myanmar has a reporting obligation so within four months of the order, report back to the ICJ and every six months thereafter. So let's keep that in mind, that Myanmar has an obligation that continues to this day to report back to the ICJ on compliance under the Genocide Convention. Now, keep in mind, this is all pre-coup. All of this happened before February 2021. February 2021, the situation changed a bit, but there were already filings that have been instituted linked to objections. So as you know, at the ICJ, you can separate out the jurisdiction and the admissibility stage from the merits phase. And that's what happened in this case, when Myanmar basically said, look, we object to the jurisdiction of the court, instituted a separate filing on that. And this was heard at the beginning of this year, so February 2022. And the court has come out with its decision, I think on the 23rd or the 24th of July, dismissing uh, Myanmar's objections. And so I think now it's, we're at a critical juncture. It's basically now a green light has been given to move to the merits phase. And this is where the substance of the genocide convention and the allegations under it are really going to be examined. I think the date for the Pompey Memorial to be submitted by Myanmar is the 24th of April, 2023. So again, that deadline is looming. And I think just a few, few points to make links to where we are now. One is on interventions. So as you would have seen, there are a flurry of interventions in the Ukraine genocide case. For Myanmar, there's been, the Maldives announced its intention to intervene. The UK has recently announced its intention to intervene. And I think crucially, Canada and the Netherlands made a joint statement in 2022, announcing their intention to intervene specifically on sexual and gender-based violence. So I think that is important also to, to highlight. Um, I think just in terms of a few implications, this is really the first provisional measures order under the Genocide Convention since Bosnia versus Serbia. There were two provisional measures orders there. That was 1993. Um, 
We know that the standing in this case is quite unusual, but it is premised on the ICJ opening the law in 2012 as well on Belgium. So we've got precedent. Um, and this has been emphasized in the provision measures uh, judgment as well. I think in terms of um, the assessment on genocide, you had in the ICJ case previously with Bosnia, you had the ICTY in existence. Well, now you've got a bunch of other legal entities, and I think it's going to be a bit also of sequencing and timing and how long this case takes. I think the one concrete potential implication also of this recent judgment is, you know, if you look at the US versus Nicaragua, after provisional measures, uh, after the preliminary uh, uh, decision came out, the US withdrew. So I don't know if that's potentially what will happen in this case. I think we'll have to wait and see for the filing of the count memorial uh, early next year. So I think just, you know, these are, it's a little bit of a sum up, and I think this is a really important case, and it's something that we really should be following as well, because I think it's one of the few cases now that actually has been instituted out of the Genocide Convention. So I think it's going to be quite critical, also in terms of legal analysis, but also critical for the Rohingya community and what this case means for accountability and justice. I'll stop with that. Thank you so much, Priya. So uh, we have heard from several presenters reference the IIIM, the Independent Investigative Mechanism for Myanmar. So we are fortunate to have the head of the mechanism with us here today, uh, Mr. Nicholas uh, Bijan. Um, Nick has been uh, the head of the mechanism since July 2019. He joined the mechanism with 35 years of experience as a prosecutor, including serving as uh, the international co-prosecutor at the uh, extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, as a trial attorney at the International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, as deputy general prosecutor for serious crimes in Timor-Leste, as counsel in the war crimes section of the prosecutor's office for Bosnia and Herzegovina, and in the special court for Sierra Leone. So, um, my question for Nick is this, as, as many of you, um, uh, sorry, so, um, as we've already heard, um, supporting all of these cases, um, you know, the ICC case, the ICJ case, the Argentina case, um, is the IIIM, though its mandate is, of course, much broader than what those cases currently encompass. Um, so, um, so Nick, could you provide us with some of your perspectives of how the work of the IIIM is supporting currently the accountability efforts? Um, and where there may be additional avenues beyond that. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Well, I think the title of this panel is Exploring Options for Justice in Myanmar. And I think Myanmar could serve as, a, we have many law professors here, almost as a, a good place to study a model of the options the, the possibilities of international justice and also the limitations of international justice and the weaknesses of it. Because we see all the complexities of so many different uh, processes being involved. We've already heard the International Criminal Court has this limited jurisdiction, uh, Myanmar not being a state party and the, there being no Security Council referral of Myanmar, the jurisdiction being limited to crimes that resulted in individuals crossing over the border and a forced deportation to Bangladesh. So the ICC has a limited jurisdiction over that very massive crime of the forced deportations over the border to Bangladesh and the crimes that caused people to leave uh, Myanmar. Uh, to Bangladesh and other places. And then we have the uh, International Court of Justice case, as we heard about, which is extremely important, obviously super important. How, what is the obligation to prevent and punish genocide? How will the court interpret it? And if the court does find that there were violations of Myanmar's obligations to prevent and punish genocide, what will it do? What are the actual remedies and how would these remedies be enforced, if at all? And this is extreme complexity uh, and super, super important because it affects other places all around the world. And um, then we have a, a pure universal jurisdiction case in Argentina where um, 
We, with absolutely no tie to the country of Argentina, the Argentine courts have ruled, that's true and explained to us, that the courts have an obligation there to investigate a complaint about crimes against humanity and genocide taking part, taking place halfway around the world in Myanmar because of a complaint by people who don't live in Argentina, people who live who are presently in Bangladesh or in, in, in the United Kingdom. So this is rather extraordinary, uh, showing the possibilities of international justice. And then our mechanism was created, as many of you know, as all of, most, all of you know, uh, with the mandate to collect evidence of the most serious crimes committed in Myanmar since 2011. Our mandate covers the entire territory of Myanmar, and um, it covers all the international crimes, genocide crimes against humanity, and war crimes. And it's temporarily uh, from 2011, but on no. So it includes, of course, all of the crimes since 2011 in the, in the border areas of Myanmar and these long-standing conflicts between the Tatmadaw and the ethnic armies. Uh, and so while we, the three processes that we've mentioned all relate to the Rohingya, but the many other peoples of Myanmar, the Kachin, the Karen, the Shan, and all, all these others that have suffered from very similar uh, tactics by the military over many years don't have a case. They don't have a process right now. And of course, in February 1st of 2019, our work uh, changed quite dramatically because we had the coup in Myanmar. When the coup happened, we, had, we uh, put out a statement that the coup itself is not within our mandate. Our mandate was war crimes, crimes against humanity. It doesn't cover uh, unconstitutional change or democracy or elections. That's not, that's not our mandate from the Human Rights Council. But we said, based upon the history of Myanmar, and all of the history of political violence related to such changes, we'd be watching closely. And very sadly, well, it didn't take long to see what we felt was clear evidence of crimes against humanity. And we saw a systematic targeting of particular groups, political opponents, journalists, medical doctors. Um, so this has obviously taken up a, a lot of our time now every few weeks is another major massacre, a major instance to investigate, and we're trying to gather all that evidence. But all that evidence, we don't have a process to share it with you. We do have a process to share it with the International Criminal Court, and I would say I'm very appreciative of the cooperation we've got from the ICC. I think it's a, a model relationship. We speak regularly, our teams investigating the Rohingya, speak regularly with the ICC, and we coordinate make sure we don't step on each other to other's toes and that we work together in the interest of victims and justice. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of complexities to it. Unfortunately, for our mechanism, we have this mandate to collect evidence and share it, but we're not a police force. We don't have any authority to arrest anyone. We cannot charge anyone, okay? We collected evidence of something that happened, a massacre since the coup. Um, assuming we had evidence of a particular individual's guilt, who do we take it to at this point? But I think our mechanism clearly was created partly in the recognition that international justice, unfortunately, can take a very, very long time. So it's important, though, to preserve the evidence while it is fresh. Now, the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, where I was before, I left in 2019. We got a uh, judgment against the former head of state and the former number two in the Khmer Rouge for crimes that were completed in 1979, 40 years earlier. So obviously way too long for justice, but still better than no justice for anyone over 40 years old in Cambodia. They suffered from that regime. So I think that still was a very important uh, process and verdict to that. And other limitations that we have are that uh, we have no authority to compel any evidence. Um, we can't make anyone speak to us, and that's, people only speak to us voluntarily. Uh, even if they do speak to us, we, are, we also have to seek their consent to share it. Even when we obtain 
information from other United Nations agencies or NGOs or governments, but we would have to seek their consent to share it with any process. This is very complicated. And we we operate out of Geneva, halfway around the world from Myanmar, but you know, we try to engage with witnesses and those with evidence wherever they are. But that requires the cooperation of the countries where they are. And uh, this can be extremely complicated. Some allies of our court, of our mechanism, have even uh, told us that we can't call anyone up in their country without seeking their permission before we call them. So it can, it can be very complicated and limited in, in what we're able to do. Fortunately, we uh, I would like to acknowledge that we have excellent cooperation from Bangladesh, and that's very important uh, to our work. We've been able to, uh, I think, gather some important evidence that we hope we'll be able to share with the International Court of Justice and the other processes in the ICC and Argentina <laughs> ongoing. Well, I'll stop there and move forward to questions. Thank you so much, Nick. So our uh, final panelist um, today is uh, Akila Bhavar Krishna, who is the president of the Global Justice Center, where she leads its work in, um, to, to achieve gender equality and human rights. She has led the development of groundbreaking legal work on both abortion and access, uh, on both abortion access and conflict and the role that gender plays in genocide. Akila is a globally recognized voice in issues of reproductive rights, gender-based violence, and justice and accountability. Her unique expertise as a feminist international lawyer is sought by policymakers, academics, media, and grassroots actors around the world. Um, and so for Akila, while the ongoing cases at the ICC, ICJ, and Argentina are critically important for holding the Myanmar military to account for the crimes against the Rohingya, um, as Nick noted, uh, you know, violence against ethnic nationalities and religious minorities in Myanmar reaches back to independence. And so what are some of the kind of accountability gaps that you're seeing and where do you see prospects for addressing them? Thank you so much, Carmen, and thank you to everyone for being here at this late hour. Um, you know, I want to start by saying that the Rohingya are leading the way for justice in Myanmar. These cases, the ICJ, the ICC, you know, Tom Cannon is amazing work in the Argentina case. They are breaking a persistent cycle of impunity in the country for the first time in over 60 years. And that cannot be, you know, said enough. And yet that limitation is something that we need to contend with as we think about what does a sustainable future in Myanmar look like? What does the building of a sustainable democracy and an equitable country look like? And that does require us to address the multiplicity of crimes that have been occurring in the country for far too long. So I'm going to focus on two particular issues related to that today. So the first is the fact of systemic repression and the commission of horrific crimes against the civilian population for decades by the military, some of which Nick has already alluded to. And the other piece I want to talk about is the implicit and explicit structural impunity that has characterized Myanmar. And that informs why it is that the situation that we're in today. So to start with the first point of the repression. So as Carmen, you mentioned, since 1962, Fearing versions of military regimes have ruled and held power in Myanmar. Even over the, you know, the decade that we saw quasi-democratic transition starting in 2010, the military had a structural role in the government. They held 25% of the seats in the parliament. They were the heads of the majority of the security apparatuses. The country contained the heads of key ministries and a veto over constitutional reform. You know, in short, they were entirely outside of civilian control. And so that transition was always limited by this, right? When, what, when would you see a democratic transition of the country was limited by the lack of civilian oversight of the military? And this monopoly on power has allowed the military to rule with brutality against a variety of actors. So pro-democracy activists, you know, we know, we know about the jailing of pro-democracy activists in the 80s and in the 90s. In Myanmar, there's been no justice for that. And in particular, Myanmar's many ethnic minorities who constitute over 30% of 
of the population have been suffering at the hands of the military. So this includes, yes, of course, the Rohingya, but also the Shang, the Karen, the Pichin, and the Chin, just to name a few. So since the 60s, the military has been engaged in a campaign of repression and conflict against these groups. And they have been designated as war crimes and crimes against humanity, including by the Myanmar FFN, who extensively documented some of these crimes dating back to 2011 in Northern Shan and Kitchen State. But of course, the crimes themselves go way further back. Um, and, you know, I want to say here that before the international community started paying attention, ethnic actors, in particular women's groups, had long been calling for justice and accountability. They have been raising these issues at the United Nations, at the Security Council, to no avail for decades. We've been working as an organization with women's groups in Myanmar since 2005, particularly on calls for justice and accountability. So when we talk about this conversation we're having now in 2022, there's a real sense of deja vu about this, because what was not heated pre-coup, pre-Rohingya genocide, is continuing to characterize the country today. So, you know, one thing I think about, for example, is back in 2002, the Shan Women's Action Network released a report called License to Rape, which is evocative. It tells you exactly what you're talking about. It was about the military systemic use of sexual violence against ethnic minority women. And they were documenting crimes from 1996 to 2002. Those fall entirely outside all of these mechanisms that we're talking about but nothing has been done to address those crimes or ensure justice. These are the gaps that we are genuinely talking about and need to think about how to address, whether through a larger transitional justice strategy, whether through cases. And, you know, as Nick mentioned, this has continued. In the aftermath of the coup, the repression of the entirety of the population has ramped up. You know, you see this against pro-democracy activists, but you also see this against, again, increasing conflict in ethnic states. Carmen, at the beginning, you outlined what some of those have been recently, and then your team has designated some of these as crimes against humanity. So we have a massive base of crimes, right? And I think to me, in our work, we've really been struck by the impunity that has happened. And the impunity in Myanmar, which is my second point, is structural. And it's been both at the domestic and international levels. Domestically, impunity has been the rule, not the exception. I talked about the military draft in 2008 constitution that gave them power, but it also guaranteed that they could not be held accountable for their crimes. It gave the commander in chief final decision making authority over anything that may happen, even if within the military justice system. Right? And internationally, the picture is no better. Possibly in the aftermath of the Rohingya genocide, we've seen something a little bit, but it's limited. This UN Security Council has never passed a resolution on Myanmar. Not after the Saffron Resolution, not after the, you know, in the 2000s, not after the Rohingya genocide, and now not after the coup. There's a pending resolution, but, you know, the profits are pretty weak at this point. And long-standing calls by civil society, particularly ethnic actors, for support in their pursuit of justice have largely been ignored by the international community. The message this has sent to the military is singular. Even in face of serious violations of international law, including crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide, international, inter, international political dynamics will shield them from any real consequences. And even after the Rohingya genocide and before the coup, the military continued to benefit from foreign investment, arms transfers, and defense-to-defense -defense cooperation. So, as discussed by the other panelists, the Rohingya genocide did prompt a break in the total impunity afforded the military, but it's not enough. And so more must be done to ensure that all those who are harmed by the military have pathways to justice and accountability. Nick has outlined the important work that they're doing. Their mandate is more expansive. They go back to 2011 across the country. They're also documenting the crimes that have happened in the context of the coup. So we need to start thinking about what are we doing more to enable justice proceedings? Is it non rohingya focused in partial jurisdiction cases? Is it an ICC referral, which has been the consistent call of Myanmar Civil Society since 2008? 
Um, you know, these are the things that I'm hoping that we can get into a little bit more in this discussion. I, I just want to conclude by saying that the 2021 coup was enabled and emboldened by the impunity that the military has for long been given inside the country and by the international community. And so to me, the call on us is to really think about what it is that we do now as a community to break that cycle of impunity and show them that for once there will be consequences to their actions. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela, for laying out that for us sort of currently how um, you know, not only how impunity begets impunity, but impunity begets atrocity, um, and the importance of thinking about um, the, the sum total of crimes that we have been in Myanmar um, for many, many decades. Um, I think we have had really rich presentations, and um, and I, I'm realizing that we're kind of running out of time, so I want to open it up to the floor for some questions first, and then um, and maybe I can sleep in some moderator questions, but I want to give you all a little bit more a chance to, to ask some questions. Um, so uh, the floor is yours. Um, I would ask that um, you come to a microphone if you have a question. Um, just announce, um, sleep a little, uh, please let folks know who you are for the benefit of our recording. Um, and uh, please, um, I want questions. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Niki. I'm um, an XML and currently I'm based in Germany. I'm uh, forced to leave the country because of the coup in last year, John. So I have a, a kind of common question. I mean, I was here asking about the practicality of the, how we can make it a, overcome the geopolitics and, and so on. So, so I see that, I mean, I walk with a lot of people. People inside Myanmar, including revolutionary forces like BDF, local BDF, LBB, all these groups that I have my uh, network. So, my background I'm a civil society activist for uh, more than two decades. I'm, uh, Myanmar, I, I used to be a Myanmar human rights specialist for the Court of High Rights more than five years. And I'm now doing my PhD at the Women's Council at Anthropology of HP. So, my, my comment, like uh, I talked to my colleague, my uh, uh, people in who are joining the resistance. So they need a, a kind of support like a, from Bangladesh and you know, cross border aid and also you know, cross border support. Uh, so when they are dealing with a humanitarian issue, so like a, you don't have a good neighbor, so like Thailand or Bangladesh is not really supporting these resistance. So my one of my uh, account, uh, a kind of encounter, the justice. They are seeking justice, but sometimes justice is not yet delivered. So right now, those revolutionary forces are, I mean, at times, uh, I see the individual people's determination to make the justice deliver. So that's mean, you know, they are, they know, you know, they, they can get killed or they can get uh, arrested and tortured during the inter interrogation. Or, so, uh, I mean, sometimes my friends, I mean, Recently, their villages have been penned down, and also their parents have been killed by the military. They know, you know these kinds of risks, and also they are involving in the revolution. So sometimes, I mean, at time, uh, food you know, protests began with uh, kinds of peaceful protests and resistance, but now they are a kind of the uh, uh, situation of revolution. So the revolution is like, a, I mean, not a type of organic solidarity can form the political uh, representation. So not, I mean, that could trigger uh, to, to drive these soldiers. So my, my question, I mean, my comment and question is how Bangladesh can support, you know, like cross-border uh, humanitarian assistance and also including other military uh, supply for these uh, troops. You know? Sometimes, I mean, military, we know that we talk about the culture, military uh, impunity and culture, you know, that has been since the 1962, you know, so going to, you know, like 1970, 1917, you know. So military with these uh, kinds of uh, impunity for so many decades, still, you know, they have the perpetrated of genocide and also war crime, crime and humanity. So international community, I see like their failure so to prevent, to, to, to take action again, the military, and now they are in the next level. So they are killing their own people. So Burma majority in the central Myanmar, Burma. So I see like the international and our neighbor and their failure. So, and also one of the uh, prosecutors talking about the ASEAN. Uh, so what I talk to my people from 
the, the real people on the ground from the villages. They don't believe in ASEAN. So ASEAN, I mean, is a kind of bullshit. So the thing is that they will fight against the military and they will win. So I see that kind of sense of uh, uh, people's strong determination. So the thing is how international community can realize these kinds of situation inside Myanmar and how they will, I mean, uh, cooperate with the people. And also sometimes I NUG, mean, I see like an NUG last year, they make a top, top point three of the ICC top point three declaration, but ICC still haven't made any decision yet. So international justice, I mean, exploring an international justice, but I see that all the time failure. I don't see any progress. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to take your time. I mean, I'm very uh, nervous and very excited to talk about my country. Sorry. Uh, my, these are my comments on this question. Yeah. Thank you very much for your intervention. Um, I, I think what I hear from this question is, is actually a more fundamental question. I mean, you know, we're, here we're talking about these international processes that are so far from home. That are so far from Myanmar, and I think what um, uh, you know what might be an interesting question, what it might be interesting to hear from the panel is really what are the ways in which um, you know what can, is being done, and well, what can be done better um, to really make um, these processes that we're talking about um, real to the people in Myanmar who are um, who are suffering, who are fighting. Um, what can be done to meaningfully engage communities um, in the work of the Argentinian prosecution, the ICG case, um, in uh, the work of the ICC, um, or, or really any kind of inclusive justice efforts um, that um, might proceed? So maybe we can just go down the panel and everyone can do a reflection. And I would be remiss if I didn't actually introduce who is not the prosecutor here. <laughs> <laughs> There was a little bit of a identity change in the middle. Um, Chantal Daniels has joined us, and she is the um, International Cooperation Advisor of the Office of the Prosecutor at the ICC. Um, so, um, so why don't we start with um, Priya, and then just go down. Thank you, Robin. Um, my brain is still spinning a little bit because there are a lot of strands to pick up on. And, and you know, thank you, Ambassador, for, for your uh, intervention. And Nikki, thank you as well. You know, a little bit of a dose of a reality check. And I think that's that's what we do need as well. Um, I think what I'd like to do is pivot a little bit to Asia. You know, and I, I think that is critical and that is important. And, you know, we work from Asia and we're located there. And I think there are a few things that I would like to point out. One is that, as, the, as has been said in this room, um, it is a difficult environment to work in, in the context of um, a real clamping down of civil society space. So in terms of the ability to influence governments and the ability to sort of influence the international community at large, within the Asian and the ASEAN context, that in itself is a challenge. Then you have the additional layer of the conflict in Myanmar. So you have questions of access, you have, you know, refugee flows. Again, you know, I think we don't talk about this enough, but we've got refugee flows across borders in Thailand, in India. We've got Rohingya that are getting onto boats, desperate to get out and to find some safe haven. And we've got pushbacks. So we've got governments in the region that are actually also pushing back and saying, we're sort of done with this crisis. So I think that apathy is very real and there is a fatigue to it. And I think now it's sort of going under the radar, which is why I think it's even more critical that we sort of redouble our efforts. I think on ASEAN specifically, there are, and I would bring this to the UN Security Council resolution and, you know, potential ICC pressure because in terms of international peace and security, at least regional peace and security, there are real cracks now beginning to show in ASEAN. You know, I, I mean, there are dire predictions saying this would be something that makes or breaks ASEAN in the next few years. And we're seeing the fissures in ASEAN, which is quite unusual. If you all have followed ASEAN, you would know it's about consensus and it's about everybody sort of being very happy and not rocking the boat, that's changing a little bit now. So I think there are a lot of factors and, you know, let's also talk about the elephant in the room. We've got China as well that exerts a huge amount of influence on the region and what's going on. So it's a difficult environment, but with all that, what I will say is there are some incredible activists in Myanmar that we have been speaking to and, and you know, we, we we organized a, a meeting quite recently, and it was the chapel house rules, but 
sort of reinforcing some of the requests that they made. They've many of them have just managed to get out. They are scared for their lives and their families. They are looking for support and they're looking for help. And I think it's it is incumbent on us to look at you know the multiple ways. Maybe this is a way to pressure for an ICC full referral as well to say, look, it's regional peace and security. It's actually spreading. Things are getting worse. The conflict is escalating, and we need to address this as soon as possible before it's it's you know before it gets even worse. So I think there's just a lot of things to think about. I think just the one point also on the ICJ as a judicial activism. Um, Genocide Convention has been signed by 180 plus states. It is a legal treaty that has obligations on states, very clearly on prevention, protection, and prohibition of genocide. And I really don't see this case, and, and I, you know, it could be viewed as that, but this convention has actually very rarely been litigated. So I think it's beyond time for it actually to go to the court. And, you know, we've talked about the humanization of international uh, We had a justice recently from the ICJ, the Brazilian judge who passed away recently. He was really talked about this in a very, very, um, uh, an incredibly moving way. And he's really talked about the humanization of international law, starting from the inter-American courts as well. So I think we do need to use novel approaches and we do need to look in every way that we can for, for redress and accountability. Also. I just want to give a small, short comment on Ambassador Rias and um, my friend Nikki. It's quite right that Ambassador Rias have raised, uh, you know, like five years anniversary we have done last August 25. Uh, 1.2 million people are still in a squalid condition and they are really a squalid condition and losing hope. You know, how many more years we need to be in Bangladesh camp, you know, in this serious critical condition, a squalid condition where genocide survivors are, you know, really hopeless situation. And it's been many decades we suffer already. And many times we have said, we have seen that UN Security Council sat down. There is no such a, we call it for ICC referral to Bama. Many times we haven't seen that. Uh, we, I totally agree what uh, Akira had mentioned. The, the coup has happened because international community, lack of action, that evolved into the military. That's what we can see. And same thing, you know, we have seen, to be honest, as a Rohingya myself, many champions, many people talking about justice and accountability. We only see a small country, Gambia, file a case at the ICT. And it took many years for other countries to join. We really thanks to Canada. Netherlands and UK and Germany. But still, we need much more countries to join, still not joining. We have seen very clearly on Russia case, many countries are joining. Why not to this? Our issue, we are a, mil a million people fled to the Bangladesh. We never know how many thousands of India were killed, you know, just because of religious, ethnic, religious, and political persecution. This is man made tragedy, and Rohingyas are just because of being Rohingya, we are being killed. And one report said from Canada, 25,000 Rohingyas were killed. But until now, we have not seen much action. So that's why, as a Rohingya, we file a case. When I visited to the camps, my brothers and sisters told me, brother, we want justice. We want justice. We want justice. So that's why, as a Rohingya, what we can do. So I flew to the Argentina, discussed with Thomas. That's why I finally came. But 
not any other countries we have seen allow it to open this investigation and make it happen. So this is very important that people of Rome are not only Rohingya facing that. And I completely understand my friend Nikki how he felt, how he's feeling as Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's always a little bit uh, difficult to fill the shoes of your big boss. But it's but I'll try to at least uh, contribute a little bit from my side. And I'll actually try to start off where we're doing uh, get left. And that is actually by the big demand of the communities and particularly the Rohingya community for justice. Actually, that's also one of the key challenges that we all face. We continuously have a massive hoop from affected communities, not just in Bangladesh, but also in Myanmar, about what we as international justice and accountability mechanisms can actually do and what we're going to con uh, contribute to. Specifically, with regard to the Office of the Prosecutor and the SEC, it's about our jurisdictional limitations, it's about our geograph uh, geographical scope, but it's also about what our procedures may actually bring about for our communities. A core question after an entry session in the CAMS is generally, how is your justice going to bring me back to Myanmar? Should I wait in Bangladesh in order to hear the outcome of your proceedings before moving back to Myanmar. It is the lives of people that we're speaking about, and it's a confusion all over in the camps about who does what, what is it going to contribute to, and how does it actually affect the daily lives of the people. None of us can actually be visible enough. None of us can actually say, well, we're doing this, and we're interviewing that person, because we're speaking about judicial investigations. We're speaking about protection of investigations, we're speaking about protection of the people that we're interacting with. So we have to find that balance as well between pursuing our work and delivering justice and accountability for affected communities, but also trying to be slightly more visible and trying to work and better inform them about what we're trying to do as an international community that serves them, to make sure that as Someone said in the beginning, I think it's again, Jim Kim, to make sure that those voices of people that have not been heard for decades are actually being heard at different platforms, whether that's Argentina case, whether that's the ICJ, or whether that is actually going to be the ICC. And I do think that it's not just challenges ahead, there are loads of opportunities. And I do think that one of the key things that it all starts with is the incredible hoop that is there from communities about now something finally being done. We're all realizing that we're already five years further than the events happening in Northern Rakhine. But still, there is an international momentum and we're all working to it. Despite the difficult conditions that some of the people are currently in, in refugee camps in Bangladesh, without having a lot of future in an immediate return to Myanmar, there's trust, there's confidence in the work of justice and accountability mechanisms. There is a host government, Bangladesh, that is actually hosting over a million people from their neighboring countries, despite all of the ch challenges and the pressure that it actually puts on the country as well as its people, still being extremely supportive to the work of all of our these justice and accountability mechanisms. And lastly, it's actually the work that a lot of you are doing. NGOs, civil society organizations trying to support not just us as justice and accountability mechanisms, but especially the people that we're speaking about at this moment, the Rohingya as well as other people in Myanmar. Thank you. My own brief comment on the interventions is that, um, of course, international justice is important. It's important to put bring cases to have people brought to account who committed crimes, but it's not the only thing. It's not going to necessarily change the situation, certainly not overnight. While we're collecting evidence of crimes since 2011, people are dying in Myanmar every day and being arrested, being sentenced to death, being tortured, being raped to detention. This is ongoing. Um, and so international justice uh, obviously is not the only 
answer and that the international community or states should necessarily get to a situation. Um, but that's for ambassadors and others to, to argue about, to negotiate, to discuss as uh, criminal investigators or, or judicial authorities, it's very important that we stay separate from those other political questions. But there's no question that there's more to resolving an a terrible, terrible situation such as what's going on in Myanmar than just international justice. International justice plays an important part, but it's not the only. Yeah. Um, so worked in Myanmar for over a decade now. Um, and, you know, Nikki, I think your point is so important, right? And it raises to me the question of who we listen to and when, right? I, I, the, when, when I think about what was going on between 2010 and 2021 when you had a coup, you had actors calling for justice. You had women that we worked with calling for justice, but the commu international community was invested in Myanmar being a success story. And what that meant was that as they had a woman in power who was represented some hope of democracy, but she also oversaw a genocide. And you didn't see the international community step up and listen to the Rohingya when they said that despite what you think are seeds of change in the country, we are under threat, right? It's only been somewhat in the context of the coup that you're starting to see more political actors say, oh, there's something we need to do here. And I think that to me is what we all need to be thinking about is why we only listen to the voices when there's something so bad that happens that we feel we have to say something. Because like, there is documentation of what's been going on in the country. You know, for us, our work with women's groups also shows so much that there is such a gender, gender dynamic to this. The women would consistently be coming to the table for 20, 30 years. You know, they've gone to the UN, they've briefed the Security Council, they've been at CSW, they've been talking about their experiences, and we didn't take them seriously, and we didn't listen. And, and that to me is, it's not, this is not necessarily a, you know, inspiring conclusion, but it's more so of, I think, the thing that makes me really question how we do it and when we do it and who we listen to. Because it's never those who are the most marginalized. We only listen when there is a political interest to the international community. Um, and I think on Myanmar, we really need to reckon with our failures on this. Um, Layla Stack, Washington University, and a special advisor. Um, so this was a really depressing panel. <laughs> I, I, I learned a lot from it, and I actually have a lot of questions. Um, and maybe I'll just ask too. I, I wanted to say to the ambassador, uh, I, I did hear China mention the situation today in the plenary, but they were complaining about the jurisdictional ruling. And I'm sure there are going to be a lot of complaints about the universal jurisdiction cases, too, because the way I'm looking at the titles, which is how do we get justice? So my question really is, I assume you picked Argentina for the suit because Argentina is a case that is a country that allows for pure universal jurisdiction. But I'm wondering if you're also um, looking at options for universal jurisdiction cases elsewhere. And then we're going to have an issue, depending on who is ultimately investigated or indicted, we're going to have the immunities question raise its ugly head, um, probably not just in the national cases, but even at the ICC. And so being a pointy headed lawyer who can't solve the social problems or the geopolitical problems, um, I'm thinking about the legal issues. And I think there are other jurisdictions that might be interesting, but I don't really know if those are being explored. And I wonder. You know, we're going to have to think pretty fast on our feet to deal with some of the jurisdictional and the immunities issues. I'm already hearing it uh, with, with the colloquy yesterday between the prosecutor and the journalist about the EU proposal on, on Ukraine. Apparently, they're saying there's immunity, which was surprising to me. So if, um, if you're thinking maybe 
and maybe there are other countries as well uh, in Europe or in Latin America that might be before for other cases and how much you can get in those cases kind of jumps to it. So we can be slightly less depressed about <laughs> uh, nothing that's being done. And the ICJ could do something as well. So yeah, thank you. Great panel, really great. Thank you, Layla. Thank you for trying to end this on a positive note. <laughs> we are um, running short on time, but I think that we might have an answer a little bit to those questions. Uh, maybe for you. Oh, I think she's. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Why don't you add the questions to what involved? Yeah. Hi, my name's David. I'm a, a PhD student at the Lund School of Economics. Apologies, we, I know we ended on a, a nice note, but I just have a question. Multiple people question, have mentioned sexual and gender-based violence. Um, like Akila mentioned, you know, you, there's this history of women's groups not being um, listened to. And I was just, I have a question maybe for the ICC or the Lydalin. How is sexual gender-based violence being investigated and recorded in context for a little bit of extra context? Um, in the ICJ case, for example, um, the, the Gambia alleges sexual violence is one of the acts of genocide, but only includes sexual violence, sexual crimes against women and girls. Um, whereas the fact that mission for Myanmar reported that women, men, and Hidra, or transgender, third gender people, all experience sexual violence. Um, and so that's where I'm kind of coming from in my question of how sexual violence is, is investigated. Great, thank you very much. Um, I, I am trying to keep us on time. <laughs> Um, why don't we uh, have, um, why don't we go in this order then, and the panel can just answer a question probably, but briefly. Yes. Thank you. I think I'll take maybe the GBB question, because um, I did want to talk a little bit about the gender issues. Um, I think, you know, the tablet is the embodiment of patriarchy, right? And it has informed how it is that they have conducted their campaigns of oppression. And so, yes, it's sexual violence, but there's a gender perspective to me that needs to be carried through the entirety of how all of the situation is looked at. And so documentation is, you know, I'll let Megan Chantal maybe talk about the documentation pieces, but to me, there's a gender analysis that's needed through all of the elements of all of the crimes. What is the gender analysis of intent, for example, and how are we looking at, for example, the dropped off pieces of biological destruction as a indicia of genocidal intent, because you saw not just systematic sexual violence, you also saw direct targeting of reproductive organs, you saw certain types of acts that actually indicate an area of genocide that has been underexplored and where a gender perspective can actually help strengthen potentially the prospects of the case. So I think, to me, gender needs to be at every stage of every part of every single proceeding and the way that we look at all of them. Well, just briefly, we, we are gathering evidence of sexual violence against women, men, and transgender. Um, I, I would just say that my feeling from the evidence that we've collected so far, and I think we're still at an early stage, but particularly in, rela in relation to the clearance operations of the Rohingya, is, uh, is shocking, the level of sexual violence directed against uh, women and, and males uh, in those clearance operations. Thanks a lot to Freddy. Office of the Prosecutor, uh, we actually have, uh, we attach a lot of value to investigating sexual and gender-based crimes, as well as crimes against um, affecting children. I have to say. Uh, it's actually part and parcel of our investigations. In our investigations, we develop specific strategies to make sure that we actually capture these crimes. And in doing so, we're trying to make best use of the wealth of information that has already been collected by different organizations, but also making sure that we actually do this in a way that is meaningful and at the same time pursuing our own investigations. Thank you. One of the response from about gender-based violence and gender-based crimes was, you know, our case, uh, how this initially came through to me is, uh, one thing is my personal 
you know, and a lot of things about gender-based issues. So my personal is, let me bring you that my my paternal grandfather was a member of parliament in Bobby's democratic period time, uh, 1950s, and my mother's grandfather was the first judge in Northern Arkan. And I was not able to go to the university. I faced restriction of movement and I faced serious harassment and immoral violation when I was in Arkana State. My age was 17. So that is one thing. Secondly, when 2017, the violence, uh, genocide against Rohingya, when 1.2 million people fled, I went to Bangladesh. After one week, I spent like four to five weeks and I met so many genocide survivors, especially women, and they told me their story, how Burmese military raped and killed and, you know, slaughtered, and especially they did rape as a, you know, as a weapon. They did in many villages. That's why we are quite aware and that's the thing that six women when i mentioned sexual violence and women boys in our community sometimes, sometimes you know uh, they uh, they are not they cannot give their voice so that's how their voice we've been uh, uh, putting them as a testimony here and so that is very important. I uh, I just want to highlight and second question about um, other countries. We are trying uh, after testimony is done. We are currently planning a few other countries to to do new UJ case. Of course, Europe countries are good, and also uh, I can't. I can I can't talk to all all of you here now because it's confidential and we are trying one ASEAN countries also. So that is what uh, we are trying to explore because first we want to see this case a testimony is done and then we're gonna move on to other countries. That is one of the uh, aims because. I can see that, as I mentioned, you know, maybe some of you, you have seen today that Chin Rohingyas were killed by, I mean, yesterday in Burma, who were facing unbearable situation in our current state. They fled to Baibo to Rangoon and they were killed by the military, according to some sources. We're still waiting to confirm it. And another one boat is floating. Andaman Sea, some of you may see in Twitter that the boat is floating more than 24 hours now. No one is rescuing, no one is uh, sub uh, re rescuing, including, you know, we call on UK, sorry, and not, sorry, UK, you call on Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand, and other countries to rescue immediately, and any private shipping boat any shipping areas there anyone they can help that would be very helpful because these are genocide survivors so this is the situation we are talking even today not like last five years last five years until today the situation is one so we really need much more action you know not only lift service i mean like we really need action on uh, this justice and accountability points more from other countries. I stop you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. I think Dilak, to your point on universal jurisdiction, just to say one, um, you know, I think it's problematic that universal jurisdiction really isn't universal. We've got most cases in the global north, in in Germany, in the Netherlands. So what we are doing is we're doing a conscious effort to explore jurisdictions in Asia and the global south. We're doing a multi-dimensional, multi-jurisdictional study. We're, we're being very careful with it, and we should have some results sort of next year. But just to let you know that there is a lot of work ongoing on that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Priya, for taking us out on an optimistic note. Um, I'd like to wrap things up by handing things over to the Delegation of Canada, uh, who would like to say a few words. 
Thanks, Madam Chair, and uh, thanks to the panel. I'm Carolyn Noble. I'm the Deputy Legal Advisor, Director General for Canada's Foreign Ministry. Thanks for the vivid and informative conversation this evening. Um, the Rohingya crises and, and the millions of people who continue to suffer under it is, of course, an ongoing concern for Canada. And it's why we've been pleased to co sponsor tonight's event. This is a strong proponent for uh, accountability efforts. Of course, we're watching what the court is doing. Um, we continue to call for a referral of our security council to the court. Um, as we mentioned a few times this evening, um, we, along with the Netherlands, have um, expressed our intention to intervene in the case at the ICJ. We first expressed that back in I guess, September of 2020, uh, repeated it again this past summer after uh, the decision in July. Um, we have, as was noted, um, mentioned that that will focus on sector, sexual and gender-based violence um, as part of our intervention. Mostly, I just wanted to thank the panelists and thank um, the organizations from whom they represent, uh, the Global Justice Center, the Asia Justice Coalition, and the Center for Justice and Accountability for organizing such a brilliant event for allowing this great dialogue this evening. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. And I thank you to all of you for attending and for staying with us at this late hour. Um, I think that's a wrap. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.